I'm a filmmaker uh, to, to start off with, and I've been working working on a, a movie called The Infinity Room at CERN, uh, the Particle Accelerator in Geneva. Uh, I wanted to make a film, uh, a fiction film at first, but after a few lunches with Neil Hartman, who's also the chairman of this um, thing and, and works there, uh, my creative partner on the film, I realized what these guys were doing was already science fiction, and it made more sense to start with documentary footage. Uh, we made it using GoPros and couldn't always see the frames of the many cameras we were setting up until we got into the editing room. Editing room. Um, so this was a first step away from controlling the frame as a filmmaker, which then, of course, in VR you lose completely because you're setting up a 360 environment. Um, so in VR, the frame disappears completely. You're writing from within the world. Your brain remembers it as an experience you've lived, not one you've uh, watched objectively. Uh, it's a far more intense experience um, on some levels than, than film. Uh, so moving into VR, where instead of looking at the world through a window, you're involved with it, felt like a strange kind of natural pro progression. Now, the key difference for me in writing for VR uh, that I found is that there's more information that you need to take in at any one time. Uh, and the information is available everywhere around you. A sound might be triggered uh, behind you to make you turn around. A flash of lightning might draw your attention elsewhere. This means the tempo which you're to disseminate the information has to be carefully choreographed in order not to give too much information um, too quickly to saturate the viewer while still feeding enough intrigue and narrative to move the story forward. Uh, none of this prevents us from writing linear narrative. Um, in fact, one of the first things uh, I was involved with was a thing called Sequenced, which uh, is a VR piece I wrote for Ape Lab in Geneva, a Geneva-based company, uh, which was at Sundance last year. And that thing is sort of counterintuitive in the nature of the project in the sense that it's 2D, um, which means the characters are basically cardboard cutouts and the world is directly reminiscent of Japanese uh, animations like Nausicaa. So immediately it's chosen to be a form of retrofuturism. You're inside the story, but we maintain many of the traditional uh, narrative art forms to tell the story. I've since written and co-directed a VR piece about the first sim symptoms of Alzheimer's in a sort of scientific context, and um, I'm preparing to make another one about a kid who has an imaginary relationship and dialogues with his teddy bear, where um, the viewer adopts the teddy bear's point of view. Um, and I'll give a couple of examples of practical issues which arose while developing those projects in a minute. Um, so. In VR, the creative revolution is likely to be as deep as the technological one. It's pointless for me to pretend I have any kind of expertise about the uh, definitive rules of VR writing, uh, what they are, still discovering, you know, we're basically still discovering them. But what I do know is that uh, all the rules that we were taught in film and TV in terms of length and format um, can be thrown out the window. Also, the need for genre will probably diminish uh, in favor of singular experiences, the same way YouTube has broken the mold of not only what format, uh, what format a film can take, but how these films are distributed. It's interesting to note that the first time the term virtual reality was used, um, it was in a French book written in 1938 about radically experimental theater, Antonin Artaud's The Theater and Its Double, that such a term as VR uh, be so heavily steeped in experimental theater, I find ironic because VR is so far the best imaginable tool to capture living theatre or a living, you know, a sort of full living space of any kind. To be there amidst the actors rather than uh, be like we are here, separated by concepts and architecture designed many hundreds of years ago. Um, VR is not only a new medium, but part of a much wider movement where actually there will be no barrier between the real and the virtual. Uh, it seems like magic to us now, but Moore's law and so many other factors point, uh, sorry, paint a portrait whereby we're manipulating so many facets of reality, its um, definition is changing too fast for it to be considered a constant. The good news is uh, none of our old beloved art forms are going anywhere. Music, writing, painting are all part of the fabric of this limitless universe. So I would say it's a great time to be a writer or creator of any kind because we're going to be writing actual lives. Um, and sequence is proof that VR, that's the, the sort of animation project, that VR isn't uh, only a platform for thrill seekers and video games, it will uh, just as well serve the purpose and it, its purpose in narrative. Um, and ideally be the perfect niche for all kinds of revolutionary ideas, large and small. 
Uh, it's been described as an empathy machine, uh, which I think is not only apt but highly symbolic of its true purpose. The reason VR is unifying beyond its built-in empathetic qualities is that it's going to be primarily a bi-directional medium. Its interactive aspect is going to affect the way stories are written, but also how we live our lives. Not only being able to trigger dialogue and action depending on where you look, uh, situating it at a crossroads between film and games, but as the technology progresses into a platform for literally building worlds together. Um, so I leave you with a quote from one of my favorite thinkers, called Jean Baudrillard, who, uh, uh, someone, someone who took the baton from Nietzsche and ran it into the digital age, and that quote is, um, change the facts of the real world instead of working uselessly on reality. So, so much for the theoretical speech. Um, in terms of practical challenges, could I just ask how many of you have already made a VR film personally? One, two, three. Sure, okay, or a VR experience, yeah. Four, so most, most of you? you have, okay, and then how many of those people or how many of you uh, were making, had made films before that? Same? Okay, fine. So no one came from programming or computing into... Games. Games, well, there you go. That, there you go, bingo. So we got... We got that as a, as a, it is a weird thing, like working with these people um, in Geneva on sequence, I found that, um, you know, while they were absolutely brilliant at sort of creating these, these worlds into the computer, there, there is this, this sort of strange crash between people who come from narrative, people who come from, from programming. Um, and it's a, definitely a healthy one and one that has to happen, but it, it, you know, it presents its kind of challenges. So, um, in terms of these challenges, which are harder to control, the, uh, you know, harder to control time, you can't really cut like you could in film with VR. Um, and it's also harder to direct attention in the sense that, you know, you're sort of given so many distractions. But um, at the same time, as I was saying, it's a more powerful, immersive thing. It's like being involved with something, not like watching something. Um, the point of view thing gets me every time. If in VR somebody, an actor or you know, person just looks at me, I feel like instantly I should be responding. And it's like a sort of odd live experience compared to even looking at the camera in film remains a little bit subject, you know, sort of distanced from yourself. Whereas in VR, you're just um, involved um, completely. Uh, that'll leave for the end. Um, Acting in VR, if you're making things, it's, you know, just like with any sort of acting, you want it to be realistic, but I think in VR it's doubly so that whatever situation you present, there was an example that one of the speakers was giving yesterday about how um, they had recreated a fight in a pub with football hooligans, but the, the viewers couldn't connect with the, the reality of it because they just decided that the pub wasn't the kind of pub that... Um, football hooligans would be fighting in. So that, for me, is significant in that, that if you're, if you're trying to recreate something that's really a 360 reality, you've got to get every element right, even more so, I suppose, than in, than in traditional film where you can get away with a, you know, framing things out and stuff. Um, da, da, da. Acting, and yeah, so we talked about that, and uh, what else have I got kicking about here? Yeah, okay, so I'll talk a little bit about um, these two things that uh, I was involved with recently. This Alzheimer's thing was, um, the challenge was to sort of give people the idea of what it's like to, to, have the, to, to be discovering the first symptoms of, of Alzheimer's, you know, without necessarily being aware of them oneself but, but oneself, but being confronted with these things that you sort of forget and so on. Um, and here, sort of the first, um, locations that the producer sent me were something they found that looked kind of affordable on Airbnb and it was like, okay, so maybe we could just film it here because it's kind of imaginable that this guy would live there. But since they had built this character of a professor, you know, it struck me that, yeah, we could bluff that, but again, we'd be faced with that same problem they did with the bar and the hooligans. Like, no one's really going to believe this, guy is, this guy's living there. So we finally found this sort of beautiful Geneva flat filled with you know, we actually just trends, but we found someone who was living like that and just went into their life and, and filmed it that way. So that's an easy trick to just not build any sets, but to go into someone's life that has, you know, all those sort of elements. And um, in the end, we created something that... Because I think you sort of want to be... You want to, to, you know, once you put on a VR headset, you want to be somewhere that you want to stay for a while, whether it's 
working against the grain with uh, the idea of uh, the ice, you know, sort of prison and isolation like we've got over here. Obviously, that's not a place anyone would actually want to spend a lot of time. But whatever the world you're creating, make it that you know people want to stay there for a, um, for a decent amount of um, of time. Uh, to come back to this difficulty of directing attention, which I hear a lot about. Um, I'm not sure it's the problem that people make it in the sense that a conversation I was having last night with one guy who was just complaining about how much of the VR content he's looking at is um, just completely directed to the action and that somehow the rest of it is just neglected. Um, and I understood what he said because in the sense, you know, you want, I think, um, I've got these thoughts written down here, it'll be much simpler to read them out. Um, Difficulty um, in directing attention might not be the problem we think it is. Um, basically, because if you're directing everything to one point, um, you're sort of missing the point of VR. What you want, I think, ideally in VR is a situation where, um, like, okay, basically think of VR as a first step towards teleportation. You're inviting people into a world, and your job is to imagine that world in every detail, so that if someone turns their head away from the main action, they see a detail which feeds into the main story oblique in an oblique way. In the same way that in a film, if you've got the sort of main action going here, a good film will always have a few details that, no one, that, that not everyone has to notice to enjoy the film, but that if you do, it just feeds more into it uh, than if, if those things were simply neglected or not there. Um, so I think in the, the job is now the same, but on a 360 level. So if this is where the main action is happening, Whatever's going on around here should be, you know, as interesting or in a different way as, you know, the sort of main um, action. Yeah, so that's about it for my knowledge on the subject. And what I actually wanted to do since the word was workshop was just have a chat with all of you about, I'm not sure how much of my limited experiences useful to questions you might have, but I'd much rather it turn into a conversation.